विंडोज में तो हो जाता है हेलो हाँ अब भी ज्वाइन कर रहा हूँ या व्हाई डोंट यू स्टार्ट द Hi, how are you? Very well. Very well. You'll have to be a little louder. Hang on, this is my fault. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it up. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I've just been kind of dealing with like my entire family coming down with COVID right now. That's all right. I'm sure. I'm. I hope they're fine now. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. So basically, we're just trying. We just come to the uh, issue of the story that we're doing, which is uh, you know on the. On the whole uh, lockdown issue and how it was decided, the migrants, their issues. So if I can just start shooting the questions and uh, you can take on to me. So my first question is, you know, we start from the beginning, like even before the national lockdown, there were some states that had started doing their own lockdowns. What did you feel about doing it, you know, for national coordination at that time? So I think the way to think about it is that if you went back to the middle of March, uh, what is the information that you actually had? Yeah. The information really you had uh, was we knew that something um, quite significant had happened in Wuhan, uh, and that but we didn't have very clear information. The WHO information that we received was uh, uh, unclear to say the least, and we also right. knew that it had spread to Italy, right. where it was killing a lot of people. And then from there on, it was spreading to many other places. That was basically, I think, the sum total, total of what everybody on this planet knew other than maybe the Chinese. Right. Um, so like many other countries, um, what we did is we, um, we asked experts uh, in the field. Uh, and you got a very wide range of uh, um, uh, views. Uh, every other government must have done the same thing. Uh, and the views ranged from something like this is just another particularly bad flu to people saying that, look, there will be hundreds of millions of people who will be infected by July and a few million people will be dead in, Indi in India alone. Um, okay. So you remember there were experts on television. There was, I think, even the head of Chatham House made some statement in these lines and so on. So. This is, so now what you have really, the one thing you understood out of this is that we were in a world of complete uncertainty where right. nobody really knew how this was going to pan out. Right. So different countries took different paths. So Singapore took a certain particular path and then it um, changed its mind somewhere down the line. Uh, the UK originally, if you remember, it talked about um, uh, herd immunity. Uh, and yeah. then, then it also changed its mind. Uh, there was, uh, there still is something called the Swedish model, and so on and so forth. There, are different countries did a whole bunch of different things. Right. Now, the question that we have in in India was the following. And remember, this we have we are taking decisions given the information we have. So we understood one thing that nobody really knew for sure how this is going to pan out. Right. Two, we recognized very early on that this was uh, likely to be a marathon rather than a sprint. And if you look at previous episodes, including the Spanish flu episode 100 years ago, 
there were yeah. subsequent several waves and so on. So this was clearly not a case of it's going to, you know, it was it was a one-off thing. Right. So how do you respond? And one other thing that we had to take into account was the fact that um, you couldn't really reverse whatever strategy you took. <laughs> because obviously, if you took a particular strategy, uh, you had to stick with it. I mean, we, you know, you can maybe do it in Singapore, uh, but you know, in a country our size, that we, once we are gone down, whatever it is we were going to do, we would have to take it through to the end. Now, how do you choose a strategy like that when you don't know what the beast is that you're trying to kill? Right. So, what do you do? So, we opted for something which is um, called the barbell strategy. It's a, oh, sorry, what strategy is that again? It's called a barbell strategy. B-A-R-B-E-L-L. -L, barbell. You know, the weights you lift, barbell? Right. That's a barbell. Huh. Now, what is a barbell strategy? It's, it's, it's a commonly used technique in mm -hmm. uh, the world of finance and derivatives for dealing okay. with high uncertainty. Okay. So, what you do is you, you create, take, uh, a, rather than choose, when you don't know which strategy to take and it's highly uncertain, you combine two opposite strategies okay. and then what you do is you basically you hedge for the worst outcome and then you use a Bayesian updating of information as you go through time. Okay. Are you familiar with Bayes' theorem etc? No, yeah. I did so, it yeah, so good. So, so basically you hedge for the worst and then you yeah. do a Bayesian updating of information. This, as I said, is a co I explain this. So, so this is what you, you were thinking, like that's how you were strategizing, right? Yeah, uh, and and I talked to and I've talked about this and even written about it in. And uh, when at, was at, this? Like this was was this January, this, February, March? No, this February. is March, March, April, March. This, this was in March that you had come up with this theory. It's not theory. I mean, it's a it's a it's a classic <laughs> way of it's a classic <laughs> way of dealing with uncertainty. It's, I didn't invent barbell strategy, by the way. I just oh, yeah, yeah. happened to be aware of it because I came from finance. But there are others who also it may not have a name, but they knew this idea intuitively. Right. So right. I, I, I may be giving you a name, but you know, I'm not, you can Google yeah. up right. papers right. from that time and you'll see me talk about Bardell strategy. And right. then the point being made is you will then respond by doing the following. You hedge for the worst outcome and then you do a step-by-step -step response. Okay. So I'll take you through how it explains our response on the health front and then I will yeah. explain how it is exactly the same thing uh, as far as the economic response is concerned. They are basically the same intellectual framework. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Both of them are basically barbell strategy, hedge for the worst, step by step. Now, okay. so what you do in the beginning when you do not know how bad it's going to be is you right. do you hedge for the worst which was the original total lockdown okay, okay. you don't know and how when did you decide, you decide that you're going to somewhere in somewhere in march not why when, why in march because by that time the situation had become quite significantly bigger because remember in february it was still something that had happened to japan uh, happened to china it's okay. only by the time you get into march that it spreads and becomes an issue uh, in italy and right. we begin to see a few cases in India. I mean, yeah. Yeah. right. And then it takes some time to reach out and talk to experts, etc. So each one of these things requires some time. You talk right. to other, other governments, right. then you call them up and say, remember, also we are doing other things while we are doing this. We are rescuing Indian uh, students from Wuhan and other Chinese. We are, uh, we are also having to do a lot of things with supply chains. For example, we discovered there are um, several inputs into say the pharmaceutical sector where right. there's a key input that is only made in China then you have to make arrangements for that no right. so it's not that this is the only thing we are doing we are doing many other things in the middle of all of this so by the time you you're in mid-march you begin to say okay now we have to do something fairly clear and drastic and remember this is also other governments are doing this we are not the only government in the world with this issue you know, Germany must be thinking like this. The, you, you can go back and look at the conversation there to understand the context in which we are taking these decisions. Right. So somewhere in, I, I don't remember the date, but some yeah. point in time, the decision is taken um, by the uh, people above my pay grade that this is now, okay, let's go with um, a full lockdown. It does the following things. 
First of all, if it turns out to be the worst case scenario, then this is what we should have done in the first place. Two, it gives us some time to create testing capacities. It's not just a matter of getting testing kits. You have to train people, you have to get it out there and so on. Then you have to create some quarantining facilities. Right? And you have to know what are the characteristics of this disease this to create... Shows. Sorry? Yeah, you're just closing for... Yeah. yeah. So, for testing capacities. you have to create quarantining capacities, testing capacities. Uh, you want to gather information about what the nature of this disease is. Not just from ourselves, but from uh, the worldwide experience. Because obviously, by this point, by the time you're in April, uh, it has spread quite widely in Europe. So, we are asking those guys, hello, what's going on? The Chinese yeah. are being asked, the WHO by this time has uh, you know, gone from being very reticent to becoming much more active. So there's a more information. Right. So at this point you say, okay, but given that we have somewhat more information and also the fact that by this point um, the economic costs are also beginning to pile up, you begin to open things up very gingerly initially and then more, um, more actively as we get time. Why do we do this? Well, May, we're, right? That would be in May, right? When you started slowly. Yeah, end well, of end of April, we were already opening things up. But by May, and every step, every few weeks, we open things up. And so this is a part of the Bayesian updating of information. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what are we doing? We are, as we get better information, better capacities put in place, we open things up initially very gingerly, but then more confidently. And we right. discover a few things. We, first of all, Maybe it's not, uh, the, the disease is not quite as bad as the worst case, millions of people dying outcome. We also know that it is bad for particular kinds of demographics more than others. For example, people with, you know, older demographics with comorbidities, all those things. By this point, we are beginning to get to know this. Initially, we didn't know this. But by this point, by May... Right? By May, you were like kind of... Getting a grip on all these yeah, things. we have a better grip of who are the kinds of people who are likely to a be month, more. A month into uh, the lockdown. Maybe three, four weeks. I mean, it's an evolving thing. I don't. It's not like I have the dates. Yeah. The, so you. Rough, yeah, somewhere by end April, we have a better sense of it. By May, we open it up a little bit more, and every step we open a bit more, as we get more and more comfortable with our ability to, to so. So then, as a result of which, I, at least I would argue, we managed to save a lot more lives. Because if you look at the death rates in Italy in the beginning, and what they are even now, they are, they've had a second wave. But you know, everywhere in the world, we've had a much better ability to respond to it. For example, we all know, and you'll be going through it right now, that you know, measure your oxygen and the oximeter. Now, if you had asked me in April what an oximeter was, I had no idea. Today, every Indian, perhaps knows what an oximeter is, that if it goes below 92, panic and so on. All those things that you now know, you wouldn't have known in April. So all of those things help save life. So then by this time, the testing also becomes cheaper, it becomes more people know how to do it, more labs, private labs are opened and so on and so forth. And we keep opening things up and you have seen at some point in time, we had opened things up and allowed for more localized responses weaker localized opera, then more or less open except for the occasional lockdown. We are now doing, for example, we recently had a bit of a upswing in Delhi, so certain markets were shut down and so on. But this is now we are in the stage where, one, we can do localized uh, responses. Two, we know what to respond with. So we know that certain kinds of people need to be pay more attention to. Um, you are able, for example, there's enough information I don't know about your case, but I presume pro most of your uh, the people you know are uh, in your family are, are probably at home in home quarantine. Are you taking the hospital because? Uh, yeah. So, so, but you you will ha you will be able to do some home quarantine. Exactly. Uh, initially, exactly. initially you just had to cart them to hospital because you don't know what what you're dealing with. Yeah. Today, today it's possible. Okay, maybe if your oxygen doesn't fall below a certain level, don't panic. But if it does, you know, this is the moment you please cart them to hospital. But initially, we don't know. I mean, the peop you will remember the horrific images initially from Italy and uh, uh, China, you know, people literally walking and dying. That kind of thing doesn't happen now because we pay attention to these things. So by, at some point, we began more and more confident. And so that's how we have reached where we have. We have more or less opened things up. There are now obviously certain activities we still control for a variety of reasons. Um, 
entertainment, you know, we don't want large rock shows or whatever. We know, for example, we went through the Diwali season, uh, the Diwali and also the Durga Puja yes. season yes. with a lot of restrictions. Um, you know, I myself, right. uh, you know, I'm a Bengali, so I, I right. organize a Durga Puja. And we yes. basically had, you know, very severe restrictions. You know, most of the rituals were carried out in camera and beamed out on Facebook and stuff like that. So right. many people did many things. So, but day to day, I'm coming to office, for example, I'm speaking from office. Right. But there are people who can now probably function from home. So that's where we are at right now. So that gives you a sense of how we have also evolved in the way we have gone about it. And sh should there be a spike somewhere, we will do a localized response of some kind. You know, sometimes you need more oxygen or whatever it is. There. And right. This is now in a situation so, where so local authorities can take. Can, 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 this is today that I got it right that you, you were watching all this happening around the world, that you were kind of talking to experts, that there was this economic story which kind of uh, dealt with uncertainty and taking a certain path, and that's what you kind of told your higher ups. And then there was. No, I didn't tell my higher ups. This was a part of discussion, and made, I had. I mean, I. You were part of that, right? I was part of it, but many others were. So it's, I mean, I'm hardly to be given the credit for this. I mean, many people had a similar view. How can we kind of introduce you to this? Like, you know... You can say the principal economic advisor who was part of the discussion, but nothing. I was nothing special in all of this. Uh, particularly in this part. In this part, I had only a small role. Maybe in the economic part, I have a bigger role. Right, but right. The, the, remember, the, both these discussions are happening simultaneously. So there's a group of people. Now, it's very difficult to say this guy came up with this. It's not like that. We are having a discussion, somebody is saying something, another person is saying something. So somewhere on the line we came to this. Yeah, so I, it's, it's not at all the case that I am the guy who came up with this. I may be giving it a name because I have a name for it. The other people who would have said the same thing without a name. I use the word barbell strategy simply because I come from the world of finance and this there is a specific name for it. Right. Uh, so, so the lockdown decision, like, why do you think was it done at, with that short notice? You know, I mean, no, because it's a because it's a rapidly evolving situation. You have to take a decision quickly. That's why. Um, if if you did have, if you did yeah. go down the worst case path, which by the way initially right. could have been the path, and it right. turned out that there were literally millions of people dying, then that would have been the right path to take. Given the information we had, you have to hedge for the worst. It's only you later. Think it would have been messy had you given more notice or like why? No, if, well, if, if first of all, uh, more time would have elapsed. Hmm. If nothing else, more time would have elapsed. With each passing right. day, the thing is spreading, right? So it's not yeah. like you have time you, to think about it. What did you think at the time when the migrants started moving? Was so yeah, we, we looked at it. I'll come to the economic part as well. So, yeah, so, why, why so I'll. Track? So we were keeping track of various things. I mean, this is not the only thing. Many things can. No, when you're, we, I'll come to the economic part of it. In fact, let me change track then, since that is what yeah. you're interested in. So obviously, there are many moving parts in this. There's food movement. There is you have to make sure that basic stuff, food and other things are provided. So many things, yeah. many things get jammed. Many many people get stuck. There are Indians abroad who are getting stuck. There are Indians right. stuck within India who happen to be traveling, not just migrants, they may be tourists, they may be just visiting right. their grandmom and stuck, all kinds of people are stuck. Then there is food movement which gets stuck, basic uh, things get stuck, all kinds of things happen. So it's not like there is only one thing that is moving in all of this. Right. Okay, so now, when we, the same uh, sort of framework of thinking can be now used to understand our decision making when we are going through the economic decisions. First of all, very early on, many people understood and so did we that when you do a lockdown, there is an economic price to pay. I mean, nobody took it lightly that we are doing a lockdown. There's obviously you're going to pay a big price for it. So the question is, what do you do in a response? And many, many countries took the option that they were going to do a, a very large upfront um, uh, demand reflation package. Mm -hmm. We took the view that we will not do such a thing because there was no point in pressing the accelerator when we were firmly pushing down the brake. After all, 
when we are telling people not to go and spend money and visit the market, there's no point in telling them, please, here is some more money to go and spend. Um, you can do that with the very poor who may run out of money. So we therefore took a, com our approach was completely about not reinflating demand, but about safety nets and cushion. So this is again barbell strategy. You're basically hedging for the worst. We are not reinflating demand. We are providing a cushion to the worst affected. So this is the context in which we created some monies were being provided to the very poor through the Jhandan system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why are we doing this? Because very poor will need some money, cash. Then we have to make sure that everybody has food. So we therefore created a um, food supplies and ration, the ration network and other networks, gas, etc. These were being essentially provided free to near free to everybody. Uh, and we created the world's largest food program for 800 million people, which is still active till the end of this month, by the way. So the point here is, why are we doing this? Because we are making sure that there is a uh, cushion for the very, very poor. Now, this is also true for business, especially as MSMEs. So what do you do? You push back all the financial deadlines. Remember, we are in the end of March, so you push back all the financial deadlines. You create a temporary moratorium for uh, loans and so on, so nobody, you don't have a cascade of of defaults. Then you create some way of providing cash for people. So you then create a 100% guarantee for loans for the MSMEs. Okay. What is the purpose? It's, this is not going to revive the economy. All this is doing is keeping people alive during a period of severe stress. So this is one side of the barbell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this, as I told you, is very different from what other people were doing. They were trying to reinflate demand. And we told you we are not going to reinflate demand. So there's no point in telling us to reinflate demand because this is, we are ourselves telling you to stay at home. Yes. Now, as we began to open this up, we then began to also allow more economic activity. Now, this is when, uh, first of all, the simple act of opening things up starting August and September Simply opening it up means that some people, some economic activity will just come back, pent up demand, whatever you may say. Just simply allowing people to go out means some demand comes back and it did. So you saw September, starting end August, more clearly in September and October, demand comes back, right? Now this is the time as we remove our foot off the brake, you can now begin to press the accelerator. So this is when we begin to push for so you will begin to see, of course, the RBI had already, as part of its cushioning effect, reduced interest rates, but now it gets more into the quantitative side of things and begins to push more liquidity into the system. We on our side begin to create other ways of creating demand. And we, and, but in every single case, note that we are doing it step by step. There was a bunch of things we did in May, which was still more towards cushioning than revival. But certainly the subsequent steps, as you see, with every step, it is less about cushion and more about reflation. So the very last step that you saw, which happened just, I think, a week ago or 10 days ago, that was about, okay, the Honorable Finance Minister calls in, uh, uh, calls a meeting and says, if you want to rehire people, you need to, um, you know, here is a, you know, here is EPF package where we will essentially subsidize um, the EPF portion so that you can hire these people. You hire them, pay them a salary, their EPF stuff, we will pay. <clears throat> then we do the same thing with those. Obviously, nobody wants to invest in this situation. So we say, okay, here is a PLI scheme. We had done a smaller PLI scheme with three sectors earlier, which has been successful. So since we had got a good response, we say, here are 10 more sectors. We are doing a PLI scheme. Now, Meanwhile, we are also doing this with ramping up our, our own expenditure on uh, infrastructure. So remember, during the lockdown, it's not just the private sector's activities that stall. It's also the government's own activities that stall. Because obviously, you know, whatever construction work had to be stalled, uh, government offices, when, you know, various routine activities that happen, all of those stalled. Other than salaries, everything gets stalled. Those activities also begin to start up by September or so. So <clears throat> you begin to see whatever, you know, 
the Mumbai underground train system, the construction work comes back. Um, the courts begin to listen here, um, stuff, and so on. So the, all those, so our own spending begins to ramp up from September onward. So it's not just the private sector. We begin to spend more, and we are telling people that look, and we will do it more and more. Uh, this thing is that uh, infrastructure spending is one area where we will make sure all resources required will be provided because that is one of the ways in which we ramp it up. Now, along all of this, obviously, things, new things happen. Mm -hmm. So, one of those things was, for example, uh, you had movement of migrants. So, when we discovered that, uh, the, you know, different states did different things. Uh, you something that you were anticipating when you announced the lockdown? No, obviously, obviously, we, well, well some, move, some movement was expected, but um, where it will happen and what scale it will happen, how the responses will be is something that evolves in an evolving situation. So when we discovered this was happening, trains were put in place, buses were put in place, and you saw that. But remember, we also had to make arrangements at the recipient end. Right. So it's not just you put them into these special trains and just dump them on the other end. The right. recipient villages, for example, had, for example, in UP, I know for fact that every yeah. village, and this happened in many other parts, Every village was, uh, panchayat was explained that, look, you had to have a quarantine. So that lock, full lockdown period was a period when, so you, will, you, can, you can go to any village, even around Delhi, anywhere, they'll tell you the schools that they have. Just a sec, let me shut this down. Okay. For example, uh, schools which were not being used in many places were used as quarantine facilities by the village for migrants. So many of the migrants, when they came in, they were asked to stay outside the village in the quarantine facility or where they had homes which had an extra room or whatever. Across right. so India. So you knew that there would be some migration, but you were, were... Yeah, I mean, I think in the end, the amount of migration was uh, not to what people thought it was. I think it was fairly, given the scale of India, I think it was reasonably well within limits. And uh -huh. the recipient... Uh, the recipient uh, villages had, uh, I think, by and large, they managed it very well. Um, uh, pretty much everywhere for whatever length of time, 10 days or whatever. They, no, they so tell us about the decision to run the Shramik train. What kind of pressure were you under? So you, I, I mean, I'm not the right person to talk about this because I didn't run them. So I'm right. not a part of that discussion. You may want to talk right. to ra railways or somebody who ran them then. I know that there was a discussion. They were fully engaged because you have to, you have to map where people go from where to where. The recipient state has to make arrangements on their end. It's not just people just turn up from the, 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 the exit point, the entry point, the exit point also has to make arrangements. So all of this was being done. I am not the person who did it, so I don't really know. I, I know it more or less the way. What could have been done because, uh, I mean, you can argue that, uh, you can argue whichever way, but I think uh, in the end it was managed very, very well. I think within a relatively right. short period right. it was managed. Right. Most important thing that happened is that the coronavirus did not spread widely into India's rural heartlands. It is true but to this day. Coming to, that for all the work that we've been doing on this, on how basically migrants were packed into these trains, who, who kind of traveled from these hotspots like Mumbai and Surat to places like Odisha and Bihar and Andhra Pradesh actually kind of converted green zones into uh, containment zones within like days after being there. So we've kind of done some number crunching. So maybe there was some, I mean obviously we have very large yeah, numbers moving. Question, like, was government aware? That yeah, so obviously if them, so obviously when there is a movement of people, there will be some risk of that. But I think it was very well managed in the sense that the rural heartland, for the most yeah. part, has managed it quite well. Because remember, we are also doing things at, at, in the villages. The villages are also responding to this. So it's not, so if you had attempted anywhere across the country, you can talk to the, the village panchayats and they will tell you how they quarantined their villages. It was, and this, this actually the state, gov the state governments will... Zeroed in on, which was Benjamin. Uh, basically, I kind of study the trajectory of. So I'm sure you have done, and you can you, you can talk to the uh, state governments. Uh, will be the state governments. We were working in we were working in conjunction with the state governments. Different right. states did different things. You may have you can talk to the state officials at the local level. Right. I am not the right person to yeah. tell you exactly how the mechanics of it worked. Right. So 
So that's what I was kind of trying to come to. Like when you kind of thought of a lockdown, were you anticipating this migrant thing? And also no, of course. Movement? Of course, movement of people, not just migrants. There are all kinds of... There are migrants moving. There are people who happen to be dislocated who will also move. It's not just migrants. They are, this, this, I told you, there were all kinds of people who are dislocated in those circumstances. People are traveling for a variety of purposes. Students, there are uh, tourists, there are people on business, people who may be visiting their grand aunt. Um, there are all kinds of people who are dislocated. So, the fact that you will have large movements of people is obviously something that had been anticipated. And yes, of course, of course. So, yes, there, there were arrangements being made, even even before the, this uh, migrants began uh, being cited, there were arrangements being made. We were also, by the way, doing the same thing internationally, not just in India. Hmm. We were bringing back students and NRIs who were stuck abroad. So this not just done within India, we were also doing it externally at the same time. So all of these were being done. Now the question is, it takes time to do it and you do not, you also want to prepare the recipient states at the ground level. It's no point in just the state level. It has to be at the municipal level, particularly at the village level. So all of this was done. Do you think, do you think this whole movement of migrants could have been avoided, saving the, you know, those parts of India to remain uh, unaffected? Well, it, they, well, one, maybe, maybe not, because some migration would have happened anyway. I think we managed it perfectly well. I don't think, given the sheer scale of it, I don't think, frankly, it would have been difficult to do it any better than it was. Given the uncertainty and the rapid evolution of the situation, I think we managed it rather well. Uh, and I think, as I said, the rural heartlands of India to this day are not very uh, widely affected. Right. But if you want the mechanics of it, different states did different things. You may want to talk to different states about it yeah. because I am not the person who managed it. We just studied the trajectory of uh, the, you know, the So fine. If you did it in Gujarat, if you did it in a particular state, you may want to talk to state officials about it. I am not. Yes, I am. I am sure. I am sure. Given the sheer scale of this, some criticism will be made about something. Um, right. You know that maybe. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I think the, we ra did rather well from all of it. Particularly given what we are witnessing in the rest of the world with la any large population country, we have had, we have seen what happens. So this is not something that I think uh, we can take a lot of credit for how well we managed it. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. And uh, if I can just describe you as somebody who was involved in, uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, some part of the core team basically who was advising the Prime Minister on, you know, on how the lockdown should be. More on the, more on the economic side um, than on anything else. Uh, not really on the, the health front. Obviously, they are experts on the health front. And uh, the, the other thing, other thing that we... The other thing that we have done differently from other countries, many yeah. countries have done other things, but right. most countries on the economic front have only focused on the uh, demand side. We have been right. quite unique in that we have done a huge amount of supply side reforms. We have liberalized agriculture, we have new labor laws, we have uh, done huge amount of research. The, we have liberalized the ITPPO sector recently from telecom regulations. We have introduced right. uh, netting laws in our banking system. All of this. Yeah. And there also you need to be clear about how this is being done. The, again, right. very important about the thinking of, around um, how to deal with the uncertainty of the post-COVID world. And again, mm -hmm. you have to see that same thinking around uncertainty is embedded here in that the most important thing to understand about our strategy is we think that the post-COVID world is not a re-inflation of the pre-COVID world. This world will have its own technologies, its own consumer behavior, its own geopolitics, its own supply chains, and, many, and all of these things will interact with each other. So consequently, the post-COVID world will be necessarily an, a very um, uncertain place and will be different from what the pre-COVID world was. So if you look at our supply side reforms, they are all aimed at greater adaptability and flexibility in the system. Whether it's more flexibility in the agriculture sector to be able to deal with climate change and changing consumer behavior or allowing our labor markets to adapt to new industries or allowing our IT BPO sector to adapt to new technologies like the one we are using right now. So all of this, you'll see an important part of this 
is adaptability and flexibility. That's one part of the barbell. The other part of the barbell is obviously we are very interested that even into the future, resilience is an important aspect. So safety nets, whether it's in terms of providing um, uh, health insurance or it's whether it's in terms of trying to formalize because that's one way of creating safety nets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or for example, we have provided certain kinds of protection to certain industries uh, under the Atmanirbhar Bharat. But again, let me say that the Atmanirbhar Bharat is not a return to 1950s style uh, import substitution. We are very clear on this as well. And I have said this, the Prime Minister said it many times. The important thing to understand about Atmanirbhar Bharat is that we will provide protection to certain areas where we feel it affects our resilience. So I'll give you an example. You have the pharmaceutical sector, for example. It's a globally competitive sector. We are the world's largest producer of generics. Very competitive. However, through this particular episode, we noticed that clearly the resilience of the sector was compromised by the fact that there were key inputs that came from uh, a single source abroad. Now, clearly, that is a problem because if that single source gets disruptive for a reason, then this highly competitive, internationally competitive sector gets disruptive. So from a resilience perspective, we have to provide certain kind of protection. Now, this is not protectionism because we intend to participate in the global supply chains very much so. So there's a lot of supply side reforms we have done, which is again very different from the rest of the world's um, responses. And I think uh, we have, as, a, as we can see, that by and large we have been able to manage this compared to many dire uh, forecasts being made, I think both on the health front and on the economic front, we have done quite well given the uncertainties involved. So I'll just kind of re-encapsulate quickly and yeah. what the funds that we had. Then you were part of the core team which was advising the Prime Minister uh, pre-lockdown and how it should, it should be kind of uh, uh, formulated and fed on the ground. Uh, to, um, you didn't have time, like for, for the fact that it had to be done in the manner that it was, there was no time for you to kind of uh, can One is time and also a complete uncertainty of information about how the nature of the pandemic itself. That is even more important. Just jump in and like announce it to not waste any more time. No, but it was based on a particular particular strategy where basically we hedged for the very worst outcomes first while that bought us time to do whatever we, else we did. Right. And then with the migrants thing, you were expecting movement, but then this was... Well, we, we responded to it as it evolved. We expected some movement and when it happened, we responded to it because obviously the exact nature in which it will manifest is difficult to judge. No, sure, but you know, the, the, given the scale, scale of the country, some disruption will, was expected. Now, exactly how that disruption will manifest itself is obviously depends on the particular situation. Right, so there's something you were anticipating, but then it was free to watch out in those... Yeah, we, we, as I keep telling you, this is a very much about feedback loop and respond. Right. And uh, and then you say that some infection was kind of expected, right? If the migrants are going to be carrying the virus from hotspots to these free right? And you say that that was well taken care of by the... British yes. And, Chai and, and but we, had, we needed time to train them, so which we did. Uh, 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 which I would just like to point out to you from these states like Chhattisgarh uh, and Odisha was the timing of the start of the case. They say that, you know, this 50 odd days into the lockdown by when Mumbaians were had become hotspots and these migrants were like... When the so you can, you can have a discussion. I will not, you know, yeah. I'm not the person who ran it. Okay. And, you know, the states may have a certain view, we may have a certain view. Okay. You want to talk okay. to people who ran those trains, I, I have no way of knowing what exactly right. transpired. Okay. So you, you weren't part of like when the train should be running? No, I'm not a part of that at all. But many people are, there are many people who are running these things. It's not like one guy is centrally. So I'm not yeah. the person who was running the trains or the health response is also something I only knew in general terms, that's all. Right, right. So, so the first one I've got right, right? Like the timing of the lockdown, why? And uh, the expecting, uh, the expecting... Yeah, given the, given the uncertainty of the situation and the right. time and obviously the time that time ticking it, certain decisions had to be made fast and also to hedge for the very worst outcomes. 
So <laughs> we didn't know the nature of the disease. So we had to hedge for, for the very best outcomes while we put in place you know, right. quarantining facilities, testing facilities, other right. things. Because there's no point in having, um, you know, doing all the other things if you don't have these other, yeah. so it, each one of them takes time. Right. So yeah, that's great. I mean, we're, we're very grateful to you for this response from uh, the government side and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All Thank right. Touch. Right. Bye-bye. Maybe we'll see each Bye. other in person. I will. I will. When I come back to Delhi, I'm in Jaipur now with my family. And I'm the only one at home that's coming to the story while they're all in the hospital. So. Yeah. I'm don't worry. You, you'll, you'll do well. Don't worry about it. Um, I have had it myself and my whole family's had it. I had a therapy storm yesterday and I was just kind of looking for a bed all day and then I finally got one and then it's an oxygen. It's yep. Oxygen. Yep. So I mean, it, all I'll say is that if, if this had happened six months ago, you would you wouldn't have no idea what you were dealing with. Now there's so many of us. Even I have had it. As I said, my whole family's had it. I was treating my husband at home, and then their CT score went up, and the doctor was like, "We need to admit them." So yep. it was like a week into their home quarantine that they were decided to move. Yep. So, so, like, yeah, like, so, you, know, so you so we know all of this, which we would not have in, had any idea about in the beginning. Okay. So okay. that's the thing. As I said, I went through it myself and my whole family yeah. has gone through it. But, you know, because we, because we had some idea of what we were dealing with right. by September, right. so right. I wasn't too, I mean, I worked uh, from home throughout my yeah. 21 days in quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, and I was out of 41 <laughs> during the lockdown. Yeah, so, but <laughs> it, it, it was not a good idea to have been doing that in the beginning because it could have been much, much worse a disease than it turned out to be. I mean, it's still very dangerous, but yeah, it is. Yeah, it is a very dangerous disease. But given some of the very early forecasts of how dangerous it was, and you trying to kind of pursue and figure out what went wrong, you know, and explain and what is that strain? No, well, they did. They didn't know in the beginning. That's a very, very important part of it. Is we just didn't know that oxygen is an important thing to measure. It's a. It can be as trivial as that. Yeah. All right, I'll be in touch. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope.